Uh, all right, so welcome to this percussion hang. This is March 2022. Wow, that sounds futuristic. And it's my pleasure to welcome longtime friend. Some might say too long. <laughs> we go back, we go back to college, uh, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But I want to welcome friend and colleague, uh, amazing studio percussionist. He's got so much to share with you guys. My friend Brian Kilgore. Thanks, Brian. Happy to be here. So I know many of you are into percussion, of course, because you're fans of the channel, but a lot of you may not know what a studio musician does in terms of percussion. So I want to just jump right in and ask Brian, what do you do? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, what I do is I record music. I play percussion on recording sessions for TV shows, for movies, video game scores, uh, a lot of records, jingles, commercials, um, and then occasional live performances too, like with at the Hollywood Bowl with the LA Phil or the Bowl Orchestra or occasional jazz gigs here and there with you know various people. But uh, the variety of what we see in the studio world is endless, particularly in percussion. Like we never know what we're gonna see. You have to be able to read music, whatever's put in front of us. And uh, it could be anything from, you know, very intense orchestral scores, playing orchestral percussion, timpani, xylophone, marimba, vibes, all that stuff, to hand percussion, to, you know, improvising cool colors and sounds, to being very definitive with, like, a certain ethnic, um, you know, uh, uh, musical tradition, like on the movie Encanto. It's it's all based in Colombia. We had to do, I was the principal percussionist on that. There were six other percussionists, but we had to, you know, basically sight read stuff that was, and be, you know, very authentic to the Colombian tradition. And, you know, we do, can be Brazilian, can be Afro-Cuban, can be Senegalese. I just did a really cool Nigerian score. Uh, uh, it was actually for Disney Plus, but it's a movie about a Nigerian that became a big NBA basketball player. The composer was Nigerian, and we he wanted some very you know authentic kind of Afrobeat stuff, and it could be anything you know South Indian, North. I mean, we have to be able to do it all and sound like on any one day that we're doing that one thing, we have to sound like that's what we do. And, you know, if I'm playing Balrond, yesterday I played Balrond or something, you know, like, I have to sound like an Irish Balrond player. And <laughs> other days you have to play Porgy and Bess on xylophone. It's it's just literally, we never know what we're going to see. And um, a lot of times I'm also the principal percussionist. So the principal percussionist, meaning if there's a section of players, um, the principal percussionist is the one who sends all the instruments to the studio. So I have... All my instruments at a cartridge company i tell them you know the day before the session i'll get a email here's the list of the instruments you need i'll tell them to send you know eight timpani and case number 17 21 32 and you know two through six or whatever and then uh the principal person also decides who plays what we don't always get the music in advance but sometimes they'll send a pdf uh, you know, PDFs of the music day or two before, especially to the principal percussionist, because although we often don't get the music early, but when I can get the music early, I go through it and figure out the best assignment of who's going to play what, try to put players on their strengths, avoid their weaknesses, and uh, also have, you know, a lot of other factors to consider, like if it's you know, an orchestral section, and we, we're usually spread out against the back of the scoring stage behind the orchestra. Uh, we have to figure out a nice stereo spread. So, you know, if there's symbol, uh, suspended symbol and gong, kind of have those offset of each other. So there's a nice left and right, you know, panorama, audio, oral panorama. So stuff like that. You never want three players on one side of, you know, on the left and one on the right, just it's constantly, it's a very complicated logistical puzzle, but challenging and fun and terrifying and exhilarating all at the same time. 
Yeah, know? absolutely. I, you know, having done a little bit of uh, scoring work myself, I know that there's always this conversation or dance that has to happen between the composer and the musicians, because the composers, even though today composers do have a lot of resources available, they are, I think, much more knowledgeable about world percussion than, say, 20 or 30 years ago. However, talk about how you, sometimes you work with a composer. You might have to educate the composer, maybe steer things in a certain direction, you know, because they're, they're not they don't know what you can do, first of all, and they may not know what's authentic. And so, you know, yeah. how do you... In a way, you you become a composer by default. In a way, because you're making decisions. Absolutely, a lot of times composers, uh, if they have a movie coming up, they'll contact me, say, "Hey, do you have, you know, what instruments do you have from this country or that country?" And and I can educate them and you know say, "This is these are the sounds. This particular sound is really good as like the the." Uh, kind of rhythmic motor, if it's a higher pitch sound, you know, generally higher pitch sound is gonna be more active. Uh, if it's a drum, um, lower drums are gonna be more for emphasis, little, you know, less often rhythmically, bigger downbeats or punches, but let them, you know, sort of like a hi-hat kick and snare, you wanna have those motor elements. Hi-hat's the kind of the timekeeper, shaker, and there's a conversation between kick and snare, and then the toms are the fillers, right? So you can have other, you know, you can break that concept up into um, any kind of drum or percussion thing. You have the motor, you have the conversation, then you have fills, you know? It's like bata, the Afro-Cuban, the Yoruban bata um, that they play in, in Cuba. The Okonkolo is kind of the timekeeper the large head of the ia, the large drum, and the totale, the middle drum. That's where the conversation is, and and then you know one the e, like the high drum of the ia. A lot of times it's maybe like the fill type instrument. So mm -hmm. it's all the same concept, you know, with with differences, of course. But you when you study percussion from all around the world, you you start to see similarities. Oh, there's 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 a motor conversation time, you know, and fills, that kind of thing. So, and that really applies to a lot of cultures. It does. And and just music that we could, that we may even be improvising or composing. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, just and in general. So that's a good tip. Yeah. When you study different cultures too, you, you can mix and match like, oh, I love this sound, but I love the way this country kind of thinks about rhythm you know, and and uh, you can mix those things. And when you do it with intent, it's a beautiful thing. When you do it out of ignorance and you don't, because you don't know what you're mixing up, then it sounds like just mashed potato goulash, you know. But if you do it with intent, there's there's much more beauty, in, for, in, in my opinion, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, many uh, of you are, are probably noticing, Brian has a bunch of stuff there laid out and you're probably wondering, I wonder what that sounds like. So I want to get to that in a second. But I also want to just acknowledge Brian um, because he was super influential in my life. He actually invited me to move into a house with some musicians. My second year of college, we were roommates at Cal State Northridge back in the mid 80s. And I just want to say thank you, Brian, because I don't think I would, this would not be happening right now if it wasn't for you. And I'm oh. serious about that. Oh. Um, Brian you know, got at me that time, at that time in the early eighties, Cal State Northridge was the third largest music school, music school in the country. You know, mm. it was, it was, uh, there was a lot of people there. I mean, a remember, lot of, yeah, a lot of great musicians have come out of there, especially in the studio music world. Mm -hmm. But I want to preface what's going to happen next with this, with a, a little anecdote, because Brian was always the guy, like we'd be in, in the living room or dining room, or whatever, in the kitchen, and Brian would, would come in and he'd be like, check this out, man. Check out this sound. You got to hear this. <laughs> and I remember one time you came out with like the kitchen oven rack on two strings and you're wow. like, put the, wrap the strings around your fingers. You guys can try this. You get the chick, uh, the... The kitchen, the kitchen oven rack, tie some strings around it, put them on your fingers and put your fingers in your ears and then just like bang the rack. And remember what that sounds like? Absolutely. But you got to take peyote first and then. You 
Just kidding. <laughs> well, and as a matter of fact, yeah, we, we, the thing was wrap the string around your fingers, let this oven rack suspend from there, and then go like this. So your your finger bones, your metatarsals are literally transmitting the sound to your ear. Have somebody else hit the rack with the mallet or something. What I did, it sounds amazing. What I did too is I I actually tied, I got had one of the first samplers when digital samplers came out and I tied the string around a microphone. So it was the same concept and got an incredible sample I used on so many uh, projects back in the eighties. <laughs> That's but very yeah. cool. Uh, so many different ways to get some cool sounds. Yeah, but I think, I think you're, you know, one of the reasons, I mean, I'm just guessing here, but I think I'm right, is one of the reasons you're very successful now is because you love sound and you love music and you love that, you're passionate about it. And I mean, you're like an explorer. Yeah, and you're always pushing and pushing. So, but yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I think we should mention Emil Richard's name here too, because Emil was really the pioneer of this, of, of kind of like what you, you know, the shoes you stepped into, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So what oh, do you got there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> another another pioneer I would love to mention, like Emil was a pioneer with bringing found instruments, meaning, you know, literally, you know, uh, break drums and pots and pans and artillery cells and all kinds of whatever, any found sound. And, and he was a pioneer with that. After him uh, was uh, a guy named Michael Fisher who really pioneered uh, having an in-depth understanding, oh, let me turn my heater off, uh, an in-depth understanding of, um, of cultural traditions from around the world, world percussion. Mike was really influential for me. He studied all these things, and when he studied something, he went into a deep dive. He brought that vast knowledge into the, the movie world and um so between Emil's influence with all the unusual tuned things and found sounds and then mike fisher with all the all the uh you know cultural traditions from around the world both of those guys were in intensely influential to me and everybody who, who followed too you know. absolutely so how about What's what do those things sound like you got there? I know people probably haven't seen that. I just, you know, before we started, just pulled out a couple things just to show like these are non-traditional sounds that you can some you can get with um, found objects, some that are uh, a, a traditional instrument but used in non-traditional ways. So like here's a little symbol. You put it on a timp on a timpani, which is the, the kettle drum and um, hit it and then move the pedal up and down, it changes the pitch, like. It... I don't know, hopefully that's transmitting via Zoom, but the temp acts as a resonator. So, and then, you know, you can change the pitch. So uh, there's this instrument called a hadfoon. This was invented by uh, Jamie Haddad, who's a great percussionist, lives in Boston. And it's basically a disc with, with different different length of tongues. Yeah, the longer the tongue, the, the lower the pitch. So the higher pitches are here, longer are here. Sits on a little tripod. You can set that on a floor tom and the, uh, the drum acts as a resonator. If you set it on a timp and move the pedal up and down, you, you get a, a really interesting changing timbre. Can you hear that? Yeah, that one came through a little bit better. Yeah, nice. With a softer mallet. Well, and that's, uh, you know, he sells that on his website. Um, if anybody wants that, it's, if you look up Hadfoon, H-A-D-P-H-O-O-N, you can find that online. And it's a really, it's a really usable 
sound and if you're playing in a band and just want to have something new and creative it's a it's a it's a really cool instrument is it uh does, does it that does the hatfoon have much volume uh just acoustically if you mounted it off to the side by itself yeah and it's threaded so like if you took it off the tripod you could thread it on a cymbal stand ah uh, okay but actually threaded mm -hmm. and then it's more resonant you'd have more sustain but for me the the cool sound is is on a drum or you know or a tim you can also use um you know hot rod style sticks you know so it's i mean just like any percussion instrument whatever implement you're using is gonna really affect the sound and that's another thing i make a lot is you know different implements to to get different sounds like uh These are ones I made recently. I saw that this was a keychain in, uh, in, you know, at like Joanne's fabric stores. I don't even remember where I got it, but I saw that I thought, oh, you know, that would sound really cool on the end of a rattan stick to hit a drum because you get sort of a, a spread out slap, you know? And I've used it a lot. It's, uh, I, of course, I made a pair of them, you know, but. Uh, Another cool sound you guys are probably hip to is uh, Super Ball mallets. I'm not seeing you for some reason all of a sudden. I, I highlighted you, so um, you're you're bigger on the screen. So here's a Super Ball, a high bounce ball on a, a barbecue skewer, and if you rub that on something, like here's just rubbing on the, if you rub it on a. A drum head, you get sort of a, a growl sound. If you do it on on something metal, you get this. Then if you move the pedal up and down, then if you do it on something wood, it's it's another cool sound. I, I, I love to use it on a tongue drum. <laughs> but <laughs> Nice. It has a very organic, almost like animal sound to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's a, a hubcap. I put uh, drilled some holes and put some springs on there, and um, I've used this a lot. I mean, it's just great as like a timekeeper, sort of a hi hat. I was talking about a motor element in a rhythm, in a groove. This is great for this sound. There's a, a band called Starship. They were big in the 70s and 80s. And uh, one of their songs, I forget the name of the song, it's on their greatest hits record. This is, this hubcap is the groove for the whole song. <laughs> That's the very one, huh? Yep. yep. All right. Uh, and then, um, I don't know if you can, let's see. Let me move these things over a little bit. Can you see that? This is like. Just the tip of it. There we go. Pieces of metal that are welded together. I use stuff like this a lot too. Or are those I, pitched? They have a pitch. Each one's a little different pitch, but they're not tuned. So it's right. not like okay. it's not something somebody can. It's not a four forty. Right, or a yeah. scale. Yeah. Same yeah. thing with this. This is a disc tree made by Pete Engelhart Metal Percussion. And it's a it's a really cool sound. It's... And... Nice. Could you hold that one up so we can yeah. see it? Thanks. Nice. The beautiful thing about these is they're on springs. So... 
they have each, when you play them, each note has a little bit of the spring. It's like when you suspend a drum on, uh, you know, with if you put the floor tom uh, legs of a floor tom on foam, that suspends the drum and it, it just rings, you know, way more. Same thing with these springs for, for these discs. They'll not only ring longer, but they'll, they have like a little bit of vibrato that just makes things magic, you know? Mm. Um, here's a, they used to sell these, sell pantyhose and eggs, legs, eggs, <laughs> and I put some BBs in here. This is a thing I didn't, this is not my uh, concept. This was started sometime in the seventies, potentially by Amo, I'm not sure. And instead of using it like a shaker, it's round BBs. So if you flick it a certain way, you get this sound. And if you use BBs, they're round, but they're not perfectly round. So they don't, it doesn't last too long. Like I, I tried making one with ball bearings and they're more perfectly round. And I mean, it's, it's a cool sound, but it often lasts too long. You know, because you go zzz, and then you want to set it down and go to another instrument, but it like takes you know about forty five seconds to finally get away. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that's good. Yeah, consider all those considerations. Yeah. Now I, I was going to show you. Another, oh, actually, a couple more. Here's. Another, I mean, I like to just take normal things and make them different. Like it, it, here's a tambourine. I took the jingles off. Just put like little gungru bells on them. I've made similar things with just pieces of scrap metal instead of you know nice round brass jingles. All kinds of different stuff, and it's just a different sound. So I like to modify things, you know, and make mm -hmm. them sound different. So then when I play on a record or a movie score, it sounds like me, not like not like, um, you know, something that came right off the shelf of uh, some multinational corporation music store. <laughs> I'm not going to name them. <laughs> All right. Well, I think one more sound that's really cool. Yeah. This is uh, a guy made this for me. And I, I like to bow things as well, you know, like bowed small, bowed gong, bowed uh, whatever, water phones, you know, of course. These are strips of metal. And there's a little piezo pickup right here. So it's a very heavy bass. So whatever vibrations are going on with the metal gets transmitted to this piezo. Uh, without the bass absorbing the 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 the, um, the vibrations. So I put some, this is going through my speakers here, but because it does need a reverb because it doesn't ring real long, but I do stuff like this. Obviously, if you're uh, walking in a cemetery on a full moon night and you hear that sound, you want to run. So, <laughs> useful for movie scores. I was uh, always curious on who was playing that in the cemetery. Now, now we know. Now you'll know. Yeah, look around. You might find me. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we run out of time, I just want to open it up for people to ask questions. Um, I know we've got a few folks here, so if you can, uh, I can see some of you, I can't see all of you, but uh, maybe put, if you want to ask a question, put it in the chat, um, which is in the bottom of your screen. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep going a little bit, but we've got about 30 more minutes max, so if you guys have any questions, now's the time. Um, I mean, Brian could talk about anything. <laughs>
music, recording, uh, you know, you know, and you and you're also you've composed things too, Brian, right? You, I mean, you've uh, written music. Did, did uh, like a world beat CD, and I've written a lot of music for commercials. After playing on thousands of commercials, you know, occasionally I'd play on a commercial for a composer where I'm basically making everything up, like. So finally, I said to you know one of the one of the you know jingle houses I work with, uh, hey, if you ever need something that's percussion heavy, let me let me have a crack at it. And so I've written a, a lot of commercials, you know, and it's really fun and it stretches me as a musician. I always use it as a opportunity to try to use some of my instruments in new ways. So it's like I view it as getting paid to practice, you know, because like. Uh, the nice thing about having an opportunity like that is you can I find a new way to use something, you know. Absolutely. And that that could be something that anybody watching could try too. just and you could just imagine that somebody has asked you to write music for a certain thing, you know, um, and then you, you set about doing it. Or you could even uh, take a commercial that already exists, turn off the sound and then say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to score this. I'm going to write some music, you know, for this scene. Yeah. Um, and that's a great exercise make it work with the picture you know mm -hmm. i mean a lot of commercial music is just sort of not really scored to the picture it's just like a little uh it's more of like a a, a bed that creates a, a feel and vibe but other times it's very scored and you know when certain things happen on screen then the music you know accentuates that right and it's really fun to do both both approaches yeah yeah, and that's something that anybody you anybody can try. Um, Dale asked, "Do you use drum machines or synths?" Um, I don't. In the '80s, I had a you know a rack with a sampler and a, and a mallet cat and a drum cat, and I was sampling my own instruments and you know coming up with new ways to use them. But then, really, what kind of happened in the late '90s is composers started really for the electronic type sounds, they started using their own stuff and sample libraries. So, and the beauty of that is that um, it went back to percussionists being hired to be human, which I, I, I get more fulfillment out of for me. I mean, there's the electronic stuff is awesome. When I'm, if I'm writing jingles uh, or, you know, something for a movie or whatever, Occasionally, I'll use a sample or some kind of, you know, something from Omnisphere or or some of the. I mean, I still have when I did made my own, you know, had a sampler and all that stuff. I I kept my library of sounds that I created, and I, I occasionally use some of those things. Um, like I have an amazing steel drum sample that I did with my first steel drum I ever owned, and. It what happened was that I sampled one note, and that one note is an amazing bass pan sample. It works as a bass pan sample in very musical way. So I've used that a lot, but generally, um, I don't use uh, a lot of you know synthesizers or stuff. But mm -hmm. but anybody that wants to work in the studio world at this point should have some way of they should be fluent in pro tools know how to work it know how to record it and 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 uh, like we were just talking about writing music you should you should uh you know make your own grooves say i'm okay here's a 60 second piece i'm gonna create something new and by writing those pieces you will learn how to how to do what you have to do in the studio world remember the one of the first records i ever played on with a uh, on Tina Marie's record Emerald City, um, she wrote a batucada for because I was in her band and she was all excited about using this world percussion. Batucada is a Brazilian rhythm, and I was playing in a really good Brazilian band at that time. So I thought, oh, you know, I don't even need to practice for this session. I'm just going to be a piece of cake. And I, but I had a little a little cassette four track. So I went, you know, the week before the session, I recorded a batucada just to, to practice, to be prepared for the session. And the first one I did, like I recorded Ganza and then, you know, Surdo and 
Epinike, Agogo, stuff like that. The first one I did was terrible. And I thought, oh my God, I'm, I am not ready for this. So I literally, every day for the next seven days until that session, I recorded at least two full blown batikatas from start to finish to, and, and, you know, and that's when I started to learn things like, oh, I like to record whatever the undercurrent of the rhythm is, whatever's going to be that rhythmic timekeeper, in case of batikata, the ganza, that's what I want to record first, because that's going to provide the, the grid, the, the, the rhythmic grid that everything else should line up to. As opposed to you don't want to record, you know, uh, something that's not really keeping the time. Uh, you don't want to record that first. You want to record that stuff later in the process. That's a that's a great tip. I know some of you folks um, do you know want to record maybe multi track or do live looping and and that's that's that is a guideline I always subscribe to. Like do your shakers first. Do your like steady cowbell or whatever rhythm the timekeeper first and and that's also gonna don't you think that also is gonna set out the feel because in brazilian music and in afro-cuban music west african music there's that kind of uneven eighth note feel right there's a little swing to it and and that's yeah. important there's one composer i work with that's one of my favorite composers in in the film world and he for each film he figures out a rhythmic template that's going to be the the grid that he wants everything to match and he does it he does it for each movie it's a it's a custom kind of grid that where he wants the 16th notes to be you know because he does you know you don't want them perfectly even if he, he wants a certain feel and he he figures out that feel before he even starts recording wow. really yeah that's doing your homework yeah um, Nancy asked, have you ever worked with an African talking drum? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, we just did this, this movie called um, Rise. It's going to be on Disney Plus in a couple of movies. I, I mean, I've used talking drums on a lot of things. Not so much in a, in a you know, uh, an authentic Nigerian context, but just as a rhythmic element um, uh, in grooves or records or whatever. I, I love to use it as just a sound because it's 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 very expressive, you know. And um, but this movie we just did, we had this really great Nigerian percussionist named Najate Agintotan. And and um, he he was great. He came in and his sole gig was to play talking drum on this. And it was me and Alex Acuna, Luis Conte and Pete Corpella and then a drummer from New York named Kevin Raska. And, uh, but yeah, I've definitely used talking drum a lot. I have Nigerian talking drums from anywhere from about this big around little tiny ones. I love to use those cause it's, they, they take up a unique spot sonically frequency wise down to my biggest one is probably about that big around. Um, and then I have some non-Nigerian talking drums too, like made out of, there used to be a company called Jag, mm. made fiberglass ones. And, and then there are other cultures that have hourglass shaped drums too, like, you know, the um, Korean Jonggu is a big uh, hourglass drum and they don't necessarily use it like where they change the pitch, but I like to use it that way because it's a different sound, you know. That's a, you know, another interesting point about the recording artists or the, the, the scoring, you know, movie, TV, music is that not only are you studying the traditions and then getting the traditional instruments, but you're also in some cases, and in maybe in many cases, completely breaking all the rules and playing things in very non-traditional ways. Absolutely. You know. And that's one of the things I love about recording is that like when you, anybody that studies orchestral percussion generally, there's, okay, this is the way to do it. And if you want to play this excerpt, you, you have to do it this way and that way. And, you know, there's really only one or two ways to do things. And the, the repertoire that's been around for a few hundred years, it's been done enough that like, oh, when you play, you know, Mahler, you got to play this, you know, these 22 inch Piotti or whatever, you know. <laughs> and the thing is with movie scores, 
none of that matters. Nothing matters except how it sounds. And that's what we're constantly going for. And we all have ways of any sound we're playing. Somebody says, hey, can you make that shorter? Can you make that longer, higher, lower, whatever? We have ways of doing that. Like I use, um, in fact, I'm the one that started this in LA. Now all the guys and women are doing this. Um, but Naga hide, the type of Naga hide you, you can buy at a fabric store with the felt backing, cut that to the size of a circumference of a drum, put that on a drum, and it totally changes the sound of the drum, lowers the pitch, brings out the fundamental. And so all of a sudden I cut the, you know, made those for every drum I have. And all of a sudden it doubles or triples or quadruples the sound, the number of sounds you can get out of this one drum. So we use like we use Naga Hide a lot in the studios when they want uh, it take it 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 not only lowers the pitch, focuses the fundamental, but it also softens the attack. So if if there's too much attack, we can put that on there and and it just especially like if we're in a room with a full orchestra, a lot of times drums toms are a little too loud, you know, so. That, that brings the dynamic down, brings the attack down. The drums don't overpower the orchestra, but you can still hear them. On the other hand, if we use that, they say, oh, there's, we like the pitch, but we don't like, we want more attack. Well, you, you just like take it, roll it off part of the drum or whatever. We all have ways of, of doing that. I, 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 I have a bunch of pieces of foam, the kind of white foam that like printer cartridges are shipped in, you know, at the ends or whatever. I, every time I get, that in some kind of packaging, I cut those pieces up and I put them under the, the legs of drums or whatever, because it totally, totally changes the sound. In fact, a lot of times what happens is like I have these big bass toms. They're like giant floor toms, like the size of a surdo, but you can tune both the bottom and the top head separately. I'll put those legs on foam, then the drum rings too much but there's still a better sound. And then I'll dampen it until mm -hmm. I get the right sound. And it's, it's a better sound than if, than if uh, I, I don't put it on foam. You know, it's, it's really interesting. It's because a dampen, a more resonant drum that's dampened sounds different than the same drum that's not resonant, but doesn't have to be dampened. Like it's, it's just, you know, it's, it, the, the sound is different. So there's just, a multitude of ways to get different sounds that yeah that's really interesting i hadn't really thought so much about changing multiple things in the environment and you know not just the drum itself but but the what you're putting the drum on right putting it on foam or so many possibilities that could be a, a really nice thing for people that are watching to also experiment with um, and then you also have the sound once it's recorded, right? Which is a different, that's a whole, that's another aspect. You've got the sound in front of you and then you've got the sound on the recording. Like when you're recording a drum, if you have the microphone very close to the drum, it's going to be, there's going to be much more lower frequencies, you know? So, um, if you don't want those lows, you back the mic up a little bit and you're cool. But if you want to pull the lows out, Put the put the mic closer you know and of course you got to find the sweet spot of where the best sound is but but those things make a huge difference too and as does mic choice and preamps and all that too yeah and then you can it, play it right you know? <laughs> that's the most talk. important thing you can talk about gear forever but nothing matters more than how you're playing something that's true. And, and then, you know, you have to be able to coax the sound out, which means technique and understanding of the instrument, being able to tune the instrument properly or appropriately. Um, before we go, though, we have a few, a few minutes, but I, I just wanted to throw a couple big uh, open-ended questions out to you. Like, what are, it was one or two moments that you've had in the studio where you were just like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Do you, anything come to mind? Well, the last, um, right at the end of 2019, we did the last Star Wars that John Williams is gonna be doing the score to. And on the last day of those sessions, we had the full, we had the full orchestra on all the days, but we also had uh, like a hundred piece choir or 80, I think it was 80 piece orchestra, hundred piece choir, 
all squeezed in the room, all making music at the same time. He likes to do things with no click, which is, you know, usually we have a click track, but, um, you know, it's kind of terrifying, but exhilarating. And that was just an, an amazing experience to be playing Star Wars music, John Williams, you know, his arrangements, his music and things like that. I've done, you know, a lot of other things that have also been, you know, amazing. Um, some of the, one of the more challenging things I did one time was on the movie Tenet. It's a Christopher Nolan movie. Ludwig Grunson um, had me and one other guy playing snare drum, tough snare drum part, playing unison. And that whole movie had uh, a, a lot of the, the uh, concepts dealt in the movie was with time and time sometimes going backwards. And so Ludwig had us, after playing this hard snare part, he said, okay, now I want you to read the same part, but backwards. <laughs> together and perfectly ready go you know and we did it we, we kind of look at you like oh we can't do that but, but well here it goes and we did it you know? <laughs> so wow. we never know what we're gonna what we're gonna be asked to do yeah yeah that's really interesting what about any you know moments where you had more than more than uh, a, a couple beads of sweat and, and, and you know and you got through it any any uh, war stories Hmm. Well, one of the first movies I played on, I was still like trying to break in to get on the list, you know, of the major contractors. There was a movie called Mystery Alaska and um, Mike Fisher was on the movie. The score featured Birnbaum and um, they were going to do four days with the orchestra and Mike could only do two days. So I was the sub Bitterbaugh player uh, for the score that was featuring Bitterbaugh. So um, I, and of course I'm also the new guy, you know, and the composer had never heard of me. He's like, oh my God, I wrote the score, it features this and he can't, my guy can't be here. So I walk into the, the studio and, um, you know, greatest musicians in the world in this room at Tadeo, this is like 1998, I think. And um, I walk into the, the solo booth. I mean, you know, they, they had me isolated, the isolation booth where I was going to play. And um, I look at the music and it's kind of a fast seven, eight. Every bar is written out. The bit about is constant for 22 pages. The orchestra comes in and out. The bit about constant for 22 pages of seven, eight. And, you know, we start at 10 o'clock, composer gets on up on the podium and he says, okay, everybody be quiet. Let me hear the Birnbaum part. He wants to hear it because like, I'm, you know, he's worried. So I play a few bars of it and, and you know, he it was either gonna work or not, play a couple bars and he's like, okay, that sounds great, let's go. <laughs> Click, 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 you know, and we <laughs> off to the races. And that was one of the movies that kind of, you know, you know, between that and uh, a couple other movies that kind of proved to everybody in that world, okay, there's so much money on the line every second when there's that many musicians in a room, so much on the line, they cannot take chances. That's, 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 you know, everybody thinks it's who you know. No, it's like the problem is they can't take chances because so much money is on the line. So they really want known quantities. So you have to be able to prove yourself. And, and um, so that was kind of a terrifying. There have been a lot of other terrifying moments. And a lot of times it's, it's you know, I'll be like, I'm, I've been principal percussion on Family Guy for many years. You know, oh, this is kind of an easy gig, you know. You don't even need to look at the music beforehand. Then you turn the page. Oh my God, a timpani concerto. You know, and so <laughs> better you better make it work right now. You know, and we all come up. You know, we all get good at making things work. You know, and a lot of times you look at the music and if something is unplayable, you can look at the music and say, Well, I know what they're going for. I know the sound they're going for. So sometimes it's written out wrong compared to what they actually want. Mm. You have to look at it and know what they're going for and make it better than what they wrote out. 
Yeah. That's, that's a, a, yeah, that's a good point. That kind of get, gets back to that idea of, as a percussionist, because, you know, the composers um, or directors or producers don't necessarily know really, you know, everything that you do or that we do as a, as a group of people, um, that you do need to make some adjustments and save them <laughs> from themselves in some way. And that but, happens a lot. A lot, yeah. And that's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, I just want to recap some of the concepts that you just talked about, though, because I think I just hope everybody can really appreciate this, the level of musicianship and uh, knowledge and, you know, the, the amount of effort and practice and time that's gone into doing what you do, Brian, because not only do you have to be a consummate musician, but there are and a lot of times, I mean, you got to nail it. You you have to nail that in the first or second take, right? Or, you know, now getting a whole orchestra with a percussion section, I'm sure there's more than one take a lot of the times, but sometimes there's not, right? You need to be able to read it, read it no. down, play it perfectly. And that you, is difficult. Read it down once and then record it. But a lot of times when they're reading it down, we're percussion section is moving things around to make sure all the instruments are in place. By the time we're ready, they're like, okay, let's go record it. We're reading it for the first time. I had one time, uh, I was doing a session. It was a big band record with Robbie Williams. He's a big singer from England. And there was one song, there's no percussion. Percussion's tacit. So I'm relaxing, kicking back. The band rehearsed it. They played the tune three or four times. I'm like not even really listening because I'm tacit. I'm not playing on this one, right? Right before they start to record, they go, oh, Brian, there is a vibe part on this. <laughs> and literally, the, cl the eight clicks, we hear eight clicks in our headphones before we start playing. I'm at the vibes. The, the clicks start, and the copyist during the eight clicks comes up <laughs> on the stand, and that was the take we did for the record. So, you know... <laughs> You never know. You got to be able to read, and you got to be able to use your ears too. I mean, yeah, that more important. And and the two things are not contradictory. Even when you're reading music, you there's so much of your all your knowledge and experience and expertise is going into what you're reading to play the things that aren't on the page because there's so much that's not on the page. You need to know all these different genres and how to make this part sound right mm -hmm. you're reading and you're using your ears yeah that that thank you for saying that 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 is really it really is amazing and it, and everybody in that room is doing that and you know i don't know if there's a way for people maybe they're live streaming now or not or something but i would encourage everybody to try to find i don't know if there's video of of a of a session of a score you know a scoring session available but what what all the musicians are doing is amazing i mean everybody especially in la not that there aren't great you know recording musicians in other cities but let's i think la is is pretty much still and has been the pinnacle of uh you know scoring in the yeah. world um so i don't know if there's a way for people to to see that i've been lucky enough to be on a few sessions um that were that were big sessions and it's it is incredible it's an incredible experience um uh, Mark wanted to know what the name of the spiral metal, the Jamie Haddad piece is again. It's called a Hadfoon, and it's spelled H-A-D-P-H-O-O-N. You Google that, you'll find, you know, his website, where to buy it, and uh, it's a cool sound. Yeah, I we should remember that most of the things Jamie designs, it all has the word Had <laughs> for Haddad, right? I think I had a, what is it, a hadango or something, this, the udu drum that he yeah, yeah. invented. Hadgini. Hadgini, yeah. Which was, uh, yeah, that was the a combination between his name and Frank Giorgini's name, the udu maker, the great udu maker. Yeah. Well, we have a, we just have a couple minutes left. Any other questions? And you can put them in the chat. Um, but I also want to ask you, Brian, like what do you, while we're waiting for potential questions, what do you do 
for fun? What what do you like to do that's uh, that to balance what? out the percussion? <laughs> uh, for fun, for fun, I play percussion, and uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I love to make instruments. You know, I, I I love that. So like literally, I'm when I have downtime, which isn't often, I make instruments. I I love doing that. I also garden. I mountain bike. You know, I kayak. I uh, I love food, you know, and um, um, I try to lead, live a balanced life and balance for musicians does not come easily. We have to make it happen, you know, so yeah. just to do, especially, you know, oh, well, not especially, but to do studio work, you really, you have to be pretty obsessive about, you know, the, what, what you do so um so we do as musicians we we have to if we want balance in our life we have to make it happen it's not going to happen on its own i have a family and i'm you know i uh, wouldn't trade that for anything and i i get a lot of meaning out of that yeah and your kids now are, are in the industry somewhat and doing well and that's awesome and your wife's a musician too. Kim is a violinist and violinist, director. Director, producer, and our daughter is an actress, but she has music to fall back on. <laughs> we have a yeah. Well, for, for those of you who haven't already, um, I put a link to Brian's website and his IMDb page in the Patreon um, and on a post uh, uh, on the Patreon site, patreon.com slash Kalani. If you haven't, go check it out. I think you're going to be amazed. And you've probably seen a lot of the movies and you've heard the TV shows. And when you hear those scores and you hear some percussion, now at least you'll have a face you can you can put that to. Uh, among others, there's other people there, but you know at least you know one guy <laughs> now. <laughs> who is an actual studio musician. And, you know, Brian, we're going to, this isn't a threat, but I'm coming out there and we're going to do some video and we're going to do some, <laughs> we're going to dig in a little more because I, I, there's so much to share. How many cases of stuff do you own at this point? Like large trunks full of stuff? Um, I I don't know. I, I Over 40, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff that isn't in cases. I, I would say this. I think it's pretty safe to say I own the world's largest privately owned collection of percussion instruments. I mean, wow. All uh, right. I mean, really, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think I can't imagine anybody owning more. Yeah. <laughs> why, why would they? <laughs> I have, I mean, Tiffany alone, I have, uh, I think I have 14 temps, you know, snares i counted i tried i counted recently and i it was somewhere in the 40s wow um and then i mean i you know all the mallet instruments and then i also i really love unusual tuned percussion so i i own the world's best bass marimba it's a custom made bass marimba by del roper a guy that used to make instruments um i've you know i have tuba phones chromat uh, I don't know, copper tuba phone, aluminum tuba phone. I made a, a three, oct four octave um, quarter tone tuba phone. Like I made, you know, two aluminum tubes, every quarter tone for four octave. Wow. Steel tuba phone. Uh, you know, I mean, just it, all kinds of, you know, uh, boobams and steel marimbas, song bells, you know, just literally you know glocken on glocken i have i have um three and a half octaves of <clears throat> of tuned nipple gongs like i have i have three octaves of thai nipple gongs and i have three and a half octaves of some chinese nipple gongs i have two octaves of boning from the gamelan instrument and I mean, the list goes on and on, you know. So um, I try to have 
uh, you know, when somebody <clears throat> for a certain score, if somebody's doing a score from anywhere in the world, I pretty much, I try to have whatever they're going to need, you know, enough for a section. It can't yeah. just be me. It's got to be enough for a section of, of percussionists, you know? So, so you're really, you've got like the world percussion mu museum ready to go. <laughs> much, yeah. When you're done, when you're done playing them, just just put a building up and put all your stuff in the building, and then yeah. people can have a well, tour. Really, you know, all the all those instruments are at a warehouse at a cartridge company, and then so when I do a certain score, I call them and I say, hey, you know, send case numbers, blah blah blah, and send the steel marimba and you know three octaves of boning or whatever, you know. Yeah, that's another thing that. I guess the whole idea of cartage is not something a lot of people are familiar with. So just to reiterate, yeah, Brian's stuff is is held in a cartage company and then he can request, like you said, the case numbers and this and this and this, and they, they know what to do and they bring in, it shows up at the studio and then he uses it and then he leaves and then they take it back. So he doesn't have to move a bunch of stuff around. Although, Although I'm sure you do move a lot. When a drummer does a recording session, the cartage company sets up the drums for the drummer. Not really for percussion. They'll, they'll set you know the instruments in kind of a line if it's orchestral. But if it's hand percussion, they'll get the cases in the room, and then we pull things out of cases because we don't know what we're going to use really until we do it. And then at the end of the gig, we put the things away in the cases because if the cartridge company puts stuff away on the next gig, like if it's something's in the wrong drawer, like we have to know. Boom, where any, if you, if somebody asks for, you know, uh, you know, Vietnamese mouth, you know, jaw harp, like you got to know what case in what drawer it's in. And I have in my uh, iPhone, I have a list of, you know, it's very long of search. I type the name of an instrument. And if I can't remember what, what drawer it's in, it's, it'll tell me. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Because um, you have to be able to go right to, they don't have time, you know, same thing with mallets. Like I have a, you know, big mallet and anvil case. I can see all the mallet heads at the top of the case. I know exactly where each mallet is and where I can find any implement to get whatever sound I need to get. Yeah. And with that much stuff, I mean, you have to be super organized. Yeah. You just don't have time. Yeah. Um, Larry wanted to know what machines do you have in your shop to make instruments? And also, how do you go about finding some of these instruments that are hard to find, geographically specific, you know, instruments? Well, um, Google is an amazing resource. I mean, back in the day when we were in college, man, you know, it was much harder. I remember like my first good Queek guy, I got a hot tip that... A guy was selling a Quica in a city like three hours away, man. I hopped in the car and I went, you know. Um, now it's much easier. But um, besides Google, you know, I'm just always looking and, and always doing research and asking if I meet a new player that's, you know, familiar with a certain tradition. I ask them, hey, where can I get Colombian instruments, you know, or whatever, or, or whatever. As far as shop stuff in my shop, you know, I have a, a, a metal chop saw and, you know, the typical woodworking tools and stuff like that. And I have a welding setup, but I don't use it that much. If I need welding, I generally, I have a few people I can go to that I, I can say, hey, I want this welded to that and blah, 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 you know. You know, yeah. press, all that kind of stuff, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so basic, a basic shop. Um... Yeah. I guess if you wanted to ratchet it up, you could get into CNC stuff, but you're not, you're not making stuff to produce. I mean, you're, you're making one-offs mostly, right? I mean, and you know, I mean, another point to, to that is that I want to make these instruments because I want to have sounds that are unique to me. I want to, you know, so these are my sounds. I want sounds that other people don't have. Mm -hmm. So I develop my own sound and, you know, uh, bring a uniqueness to a score. Right. And that's the other, that's another aspect. And you mean, you could look at that as both, 
you know, you striving to have a sound because of the sound, but also, you know, there's a little bit of job security in woven into that, I suppose. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just like any, I mean, that's goes with any profession. I think you want to have something, we all need to bring something unique to yeah. the table. Yeah. And of course, our, the main element of that is our, our brain. Yep. Creativity. And, our and our, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I think we're, I think we're good. Uh, and I, Brian, I can't thank you enough for spending, you know, your, your, your Saturday morning and your time. I know your time is valuable. So thank you so much. My pleasure. It's been fun. And um, yeah. And thanks everybody who's, who's attending a lot here live on our percussion hang. Thanks to all the patrons uh, uh, who support the channel and my work. And um, yeah, I'm going to come out there, Brian. We're going to, we're going to eat. Wow. We're going to do some gardening and maybe we'll do a little bit of drumming stuff. Bring a mountain bike. <laughs> I'm gonna. I've been thinking about getting the the electric assist because uh, oh, no. we actually have. Oh yeah, I'm too old for that. No, no, I'm kidding. No. I'll hurt whatever, myself. Hey, whatever, whatever brings you joy. <laughs> seriously, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I, I like. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to. I like working hard to get up the mountain. You know, but you know, I totally. Uh, I totally get it. Yeah. Well, you know, we're getting our our late fifties here. Some of us are in our sixties. I'm not mentioning any names, but, um, you know, I just don't want to hurt myself, but Hey, yeah. it's, you know, it's really been great. Uh, thank you so much again. And, um, yeah, I look forward to hearing you more and seeing you live. Watch TV you'll, or a movie. You'll hear me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, not too many people can say that. That's pretty awesome. I like that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Brian.